All right. So we're going to talk about research questions and um, some other stuff about <clears throat> like asking the right questions and trying to figure out how to solve some of the research questions that or research problems that you have. So we we have to think like, okay, what comes first? Like this question or this observation that we're seeing. And a lot of us end up looking at the world, and I think we're all innately scientists. We say, I wonder why that thing works that way. Because you see some outcome and then you come up with a question. But then sometimes you ask a question and you you start to dig and then you see some new outcome. Well, if you're starting from scratch and you want to see what other like how you might answer that question, you could go into the literature. And the literature on the, the stuff that you're really, really interested in is going to provide you a lot of really good guidance about how to design research. Like I said, we're, we're scientists. We, we want to figure out why things work that way. But we've also been preceded by generations of scientists who've asked similar questions. We should figure out what they've thought about first. So digging into the literature allows us to develop a better research question, but we also started with a research question that drove us into the literature. I don't want you to decouple those two things because they're really, really crucial. Asking good questions, figuring out what other people have asked, and then refining our questions to ask it better. Now, you can't get stuck in the literature. You've got to go and do other things. Um, we have to move science forward. Um, and the best way to do that is to think about our work as, a, as like a triangle. So in a triangle, we have like what's gone before us, the theory, the literature. We have um, some new data. So an application to a new spot or in a specific study, or we can move a method. So you can't move all three of those corners of the triangle without it being unhinged from where it's at. So you can move one, one of these, but you have to keep the other two stable. So um, let's think about um, like a, a research study maybe on um, plant ecology. And so we have these ideas about plant ecology and we have um, <clears throat> the same method. We're gonna apply the same method of doing the investigation that previous people have done it, but we're gonna now apply it to a new place to see how it fits or how we can grow literature. We can't take that plant ecology um, question in that literature and then apply a brand new method and gather new data in a new site without unhinging ourselves from knowing which one of those two things, whether or not it's the method or the data that's driving our outcomes. So in order to be firmly planted, you can move one of those corners at a time, but not two. You can either use the same method and the same sort of theory literature and apply it to a new case, or you could use the same uh, theory and literature and case or data application and try a new method to measure, or you can use you know, the same case and the same method and think about how it might drive the theory forward. So you have to be rooted in, um, in one of those, uh, in two of those things to keep, to keep science moving forward. Um, all right, so, <clears throat> We have to ask the right questions. We have to make sure that we are um, doing the kind of work that we want to work, we want to do. Basic research really is unapplied. It's like trying to figure out the science for the science's sake. Applied research is trying to understand how basic research could be applied to a specific setting. And um, trying to figure out what kind of question really, really matters because the question is going to drive the method and the sampling strategy and what you're gonna measure and how you're gonna measure it, what are you gonna leave out? If, you're, if you go out into, um, into the world and you start saying, well, I've got data here and I got data there and I got this and this, you can really quickly lose focus um, on like, let's say a, an applied project. You're trying to figure out how to solve a problem. And if you're just gathering data to gather data to sake and you can't figure out what the question is, you're gonna spend a lot of time digging around, but it might not help you move your answer forward. So <clears throat> each research question should be clear and answerable. It should not take you five sentences to tell me what your research question is. Um, you should also kind of know why you're asking it. The why you're asking it will help you um, undermine, or like investigate whether or not you have some bias that might undermine your, your project. So if there's a good, clear rationale why you're asking the question and like what the question exactly is, then I think you're on the right track but you still should be able to say the question within like one sentence. 
Um, for example, in my dissertation, uh, my research question was really driven um, around this idea. This is, which is, um, how do governments encourage businesses to take on self-regulatory strategies like environmental management systems? And that was it. Now, I answered that question by looking at international data. I investigated, like looking in, at the federal level. I did a whole bunch of these other things, but really at the core of my question was, how can we get governments to help businesses self-regulate? I thought, you know, I can, I can talk to somebody in the elevator about that. So if you're going to write this down, if you're writing a research study, you need to let the reader know very early, like in the first paragraph or two, like what is the question that you're trying to, to solve? And then as you're writing, you know, you don't just say, hey, this is my research question, blah, blah, blah. You have to like have some catchy phrase at the beginning that sort of says, this is why my study is important. And then you ask the question and then you lay out like how you're going to move forward with your answer. If you're writing a, a thesis or a project, it's very, very, that first paper, or the first page is very, very crucial to sort of show the reader how they're going to be able to understand your approach to what you've done. So once again, some sort of catchy phrase, like why is it relevant? Tell me what your research question is, and then tell me how you're going to answer that research question, lay out an outline in your, in your paper. We can talk about more about this more, but more or less, you're saying, I'm going to start here. I'm going to tell you this part, this part, this part, and then in the next part of the paper, you're like, dun, 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 A, B, C in the intro, A, B, C in the body of the paper. It just makes the reader really get it. Okay. So what I'm going to have you do as part of your homework is I want you to describe your research interests, write a paragraph, um, include anything that you've read about that topic. And then after you've done, you're done writing that one, one paragraph, I want you to pause and take a second and say, okay, what's my outcome that I'm interested in? Describe the dependent variable, the thing that the, the outcome of interest that you want. Take two sentences to do that. Then write a list of independent variables. What are the factors that could potentially cause the change in that dependent variable? And you might want to include a reason for e each one of those. Like, I think it's because this is related to that and this is important to understand. And, and write that out. So after you've gone through all of that, you should be able to kind of build a model in your brain about what that is. And then can you abstract yourself for just a second and look at all that work that you just did, you know, the paragraph describing your interests, what you know about your outcome variable, your dependent variable, what factors might have affected it. You step back and you look at it for a second, you go, okay, so how does this all fit together? And can I write a research question in one or two, um, in two sentences that describes this thing that I'm looking at, my outcome and all the factors? Is there a big broad theme? Is it trying to answer a bigger question that maybe I haven't abstracted yet? Like, is there something core in there that I've added these other variables, but really I'm only interested in this one thing. And these other variables are like interesting, but not core to my question. When you do that, what you, you get to do is you lay it all out on paper, you get a scope of what you're, what's going on in your brain. And then you say, okay, now I've got to summarize it. And you will have many points in your career where you'll, you will be in a room with somebody for 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And they'll say, tell me about what, what you're interested in. Oh man, if you can go right to this is the core of what I'm looking at. And you can do it in a clear, concise way in like 20 seconds. You can build like an amazing rapport with people and you can show how wickedly smart you are. Um, but you don't really have more than about 20, 30, 40 seconds unless they take the bait. Like if you're fishing, they take the bait and you've got them on the hook. So you've got to really figure out what it is at the core of what you're doing. Okay. So that's the question. Now, how do we do the research? This is the research design. We're going to talk more about this a lot. There's two general approaches to do research. Um, and it's mostly just about how you gather data and what the data looks like. Quantitative da data are measurements that can be coded into categorical or numerical values. Something that you can um, you know, give a number to or a letter or a code that, that can be ranked, that can be measured. Um, if you use quantitative measures, you can use statistical tests, you can use summary statistics. There are a lot of different things you can do quantitatively. Percent vegetative cover on, a, on an area. You could look at habitat um, speciation, like how many times does something show up at a certain area? Um, percentage of an area that, that is covered by wetland. Um, those are all quantitative. You're actually measuring something that can be coded into actual data. Uh, qualitative type approach is largely based on observation. 
it's complex. You, you're you're able to like use causal like identify causal mechanisms. Um, it relies a lot on an observer who's been trained to uh, see what's going on in the world. Um, I think about uh, Jason Fitzgibbon, who who will come to our class. He goes out and he takes quantitative measurements, um, you know, with bird habitat and you know this sort of thing. But he is also out sitting. Um, thinking about what's going on in the ecosystem. He's making observations about bird patterns that maybe you can't really describe. He's seeing some interactions that maybe don't have a way to code them. Um, maybe he's looking at processes that he's seeing um, as something happens, this other thing happens, but it, it's not really like A plus B equals C. Um, qualitative is a lot squishier. Um, we get a lot of narrative research um, and and it does rely a lot on, on the person who's doing the work to be well-trained and be able to be descriptive. Now, is one better than the other? No, they're just different and they do different things. Quantitative research, you do definitely find more in sort of uh, hard sciences. Uh, and qualitative research, uh, you know, I'm in a field that does a lot of quantitative work, but there are qualitative environmental philosophy kind of stuff, totally fine. It's not my cup of tea and it does have its place. It just answers different kinds of questions. So like I said at the very beginning, your research question is gonna drive how you're gonna gather data and how you're gonna design the research. So if you have a, a research question that's really gonna need quantitative data, you'll need a, a quantitative skill set to go gather that data and code it and run the tests. If you have a question you know, that's much lends itself to more qualitative, you're gonna to have to know those methods. You might have to use triangulation. You might have to interview three or four different people to try and get a sense of what they saw or how they're perceiving of the world to try and figure out what's really going on if you weren't there. Different skill set, but you can't just be like, well, I'm a quantitative researcher and I answer all of my research questions quantitatively. Like, that, doesn't, that doesn't really work. Like if I need a wrench, I need a wrench. And if I need a hammer, I need a hammer, but like I can't really turn a bolt, a nut on a bolt with a hammer. I need a wrench for that. Like, and I could kind of maybe pound a nail with a wrench, but, but really I need a hammer for that. So like the kind of problem that you're trying to solve, the questions you ask really, really drive everything. Okay, so here's some of the, the things that, that like I did when I was a soil consultant, or a, a, sorry, a, a mining reclamation consultant. So we wanted to look at the distribution of a specific bush on this mine, the Atropolis canensis, so it's a four wing salt bush. We wanted to see if there were patterns. Well, okay, so we went out and gathered location data and we mapped it on GIS. And we also, while we were there, we looked at slope, which way was it sloping? Was there erosion? What kind of soil was it in? Um, you know, like we gathered a lot of that information. Um, well, how did I do that? Well, I needed some quantitative measurements, but I also needed some qualitative measurements. Like um, I needed to see what that landscape looked like so that I could sort of build in my mind some familiarity with how that, that thing was working. Okay, well, that's cool. That, that's totally fine. But sometimes you have to mix those modes. Uh, we, we ask questions on a different, or sorry. Yeah, I guess it was on the same mind. Is the, uh, uh, is the depth of the soil related to the distribution of that of that species on the mine. Okay, well then I got a different school a skill set. I've got to go now dig to figure out um, how deep the soil is near those places. Well, that's going to take a quantitative measurement. Like that's very very quantitative. Depth of soil is a measurement, a single thing. You know. All right. Now here's a different question: Does increasing the depth of soil create an increase in the survival rate of that thing on the mine? Well, how do I do that? Cause I can't just like randomly figure out the depth of soil without disturbing the soil. And I can't really plant the plants in disturbed soil cause that'll change the soil dynamics. So what we did was we actually built <laughs> a research plot and we, we put in the bad dirt at an angle this way. And then we put in different types of good dirt at an angle this way to see if we could get different things to grow in different areas of that, of that plot. And we had a distribution of the bad dirt and a distribution of the good dirt, and they were they were offset like this. So we had really deep areas and we had really shallow areas. So we had to use an experimental strategy. So the you know the first question might be observational. I can go look at that. I can measure it with GIS. That's an observational strategy. The depth of the soil one. It's like um, 
is a correlational study. I go and I measure that, that, that number of soil depth and I look at how distributed that, that thing is. So I run some statistical tests. The third one is really like an experiment or a quasi experiment because I'm controlling all the factors that drive that study. And so, you know, what I want to know, <clears throat> my research question is going to drive how I'm going to get that data. And we spent a lot of money on that, on that um, experimental plot, but it helped us solve a question that, that the other stuff, the correlational research from the depth of soil answered, but not very well. So we, the question always drives a strategy. Okay. So every time we design some research, we have to be thinking about a couple key factors. And these include um, internal validity. So is the model that I'm building or the relationships that I'm looking at, do they make sense logically? And based on the literature and based on maybe some preliminary data gathering, does it look like the research is gonna, or the, 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 the patterns exist to support what I'm studying? Okay, external validity. If I design an experiment and I control the soil depth and I control all the moisture and I control all that stuff, how valid is my work going to be to a mine where I can't control that or to the distribution of that type of plant, you know, in the wild and undisturbed soil? Well, we can design, we can design an experiment to kind of replicate that, but because it's an experiment, we have to control for it. So there's all sorts of these concerns about like, how can I apply what I've learned to somewhere else? That's external validity. Um, there's some artifacts and you should look them up in the, in the readings, but um, whenever we deal with time or we subject a subject to like multiple stimuli, then the second stimulus on that individual is probably either more or less stimulating than the first time because we now have a repeated measure and they know what to look forward to. So that's one of those artifacts, time, maturation, instrumentation, um, if you like, if I wear it, weigh myself on the same scale and it's got a spring in it for 20 years, the spring is going to wear out. So the measure is going to be slightly different. So however we design research, there are going to be some artifacts that we should be aware of. Some of the other things that we most care about are causality. We really, really, really want to control things so that we can see if there's a direct link. But every time we add control to our study, we reduce its ability to be, to be applied somewhere else. So causality is, you know, looking for those four things. Um, we've got to be really cautious in, in how we do that and be aware that we might find correlational research that looks like it's causal, but without those other three criteria, it can't be causal. Um, how we control for things, I've already talked about that. How much control can we introduce? How much variability is there going to be in our design? Those are problems. The other one is power and statistical power is largely based on how many cases you find. We call these degrees of freedom. So if there's like one endangered species left, you say, I want to know why that endangered species does this thing. You can study that endangered species forever, but you only have one data point and you can't draw a line with one data point and you need a line to see a trajectory or relationship. So what you do is, is you think about like how many cases, how many samples, how many pieces of information can I get to see what that relationship looks like? And when we gather more data, we have more power. We are more confident in our estimate. We're more confident in our relationships. And so the statistical concern for that is called um, degrees of freedom. The concept for that is degrees of freedom and it's related to power um, in kind of weird ways, but they're concerns for each design case studies are horrible with power. They're horrible with control. They're really largely descriptive, but a lot of people like case studies. Well, you can learn a lot from a case study. You can dig in there, but it's not gonna be good for predicting what happens next because it has zero external validity. It has zero power and you've got zero control. Uh, I've done lots of correlational research looking at large patterns in one time period between different you know, groups. Okay, then I can control for some things, but it's not very valid over time. I can only tell you what happened in that time and using all these different data points for control. Lots of power, lots of degrees of freedom, zero control really, I mean, except for variation um, among cases, um, but I'm not manipulating them I mean, like in terms of experimental control. Um, 
and it's really not largely valid over time. It's largely valid for for you know geographic area or uh, you know that subset of cases I'm working on, but it doesn't apply other places. So. Um, once again, internal validity is like single unambiguous explanation for the relationships. There are lots of potential threats. For example, um, in a model, this would be the dependent variable in the middle. All of these other things are factors that might affect it. <clears throat> but there's some threats to internal validity, like you might have missed something that was really crucial, an omitted variable. And you're not measuring it, so you can't see the relationship. Here's another unmeasured variable. Like there's something out here that you haven't even thought about that's putting a lot of pressure on it. Um, this is this is one of those things where like temperature could be affecting ice cream sales and deaths. Um, this could be uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, an intervening variable, uh, confounding variables. Um, so lots of omitted variable bias. Um, there's lots of other things that can happen there. Um, you could have assignment bias. That's in other words, like some people showed up in your sample and you oversampled them or they got sent to different research groups than they should have. Um, that can mess up your internal validity. Um, like let's say you're, you're doing an inter internet-based survey and you take the first 100 respondents. Okay, that's totally fine. But those first 100 respondents saw the, the research prompt very early on. They, they, they agreed to participate very quickly. They were energetic but you don't really want all those people. You want some people that might take some persuasion to get into your study because chances are these people who showed up first are probably different than the people who showed up last in, on some factor. And so you need to make some sort of consideration for that. Uh, I covered some of these previously, but history, if they've had previous exposure, uh, that can cause some, some problems with internal validity. Um, maturation is that our responses may change over time, even if we don't have previous history with it. Like old people respond differently than young people, um, but also things age differently. Uh, instrumentation, you have to make sure that you're measuring things the exact same way all the time. Sometimes our measures might change. Um, like the way that we think about aggression previously might be different after, you know, um, a, 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 like some aggressive attack on a school or something. So the way that we measure something that's instrumentation that might change over time or might have different um, uh, description or assignments of, of uh, sort of uh, environmental uh, context, sorry. Um, we have threats to internal validity like testing order effects. That's to say um, the way in which we assign stimulus to different groups might affect the types of stimulation that they get. Um, and I can explain that probably better in a, in a future lecture. The last one is regression towards the mean. And people who are super stellar in school um, will probably be super stellar in whatever group of people they're in. But there's a big group of folks who are in the middle. And sometimes they're super stellar and sometimes they're really bad. But overall, things regress towards the mean. In other words, you can have this big spread of people who are super achievers and super underperformers, but most of the time people will stay in the middle. Well, what does that mean? Like over time, if that mean is changing, they're all changing and they're all kind of coming to the middle. Um, I was like in the top third of my high school class in a really underperforming school. And then my sophomore year, I moved to a really, really high performing school. And you know where I ended up? In the top third of my class. Like why, like what happened? Well, something happens where um, I was, if I were to compare these two schools, this school and this school, I was like in the top third at this school, which would be in like the bottom of this other school. But when I got there, everyone's expectations were higher and I met those expectations. Well, how does that work? Well, that's partially regression to the mean that, that I would find the middle in whatever group I was gonna be in, just kind of who I am. Okay, we've already talked about external validity, the extent to the sample, the, the sample reflects the population. We talked about selection bias. So we've got to make sure that the sample reflects the population we're looking at. Um, but also we might be selecting on different characteristics when we go in and gather data. We might want to look at north slopes, south slopes, if we're talking about vegetation. We might want to look at um, age, race, religiousness, whatever that is, if we're doing social studies. Um, so we're trying to compare the sample to the population. We're also trying to compare studies to studies. 
when we're trying to compare research to the real world. Um, when we're trying to compare like our research to the real world, we have to recognize that the way we measure something might not be generalizable. It might not apply. Like for example, we talk about like Asian markets versus Hispanic markets versus like um, traditional like Albertson kind of, you know, and Caucasian kind of markets. Um, we, if we're not measuring the thing the right way, then the, then the results won't be applicable outside of our study. Um, and then time, your context matters in a lot of this stuff. And I think um, if you're looking at pre 9-11, post 9-11, pre-COVID, post-COVID, there's a lot of these external things that, that have changed that might make some previous studies totally not applicable. Uh, one of my research professors at, at Kansas wrote a study on um, Eastern East, East German politics when East Germany was a place. And um, he went to publish the book. And a month before the publishers published the book, East Germany fell and it was no longer. I'm like, well, he knew a lot about East German politics and how that government worked until that government didn't exist anymore. And then, you know, didn't publish a book. So time matters a lot to the extent we can apply some of these studies to other places. Remember causality, time order, covariation, non spuriousness theoretical justification. I threw that in there because it's like my favorite example. In order for your face, if, if you want to blame me for your face hurting, my fist had to move first. You know, that's fun. Okay, last concept here is degrees of freedom. These are concerns for all of the designs. Degrees of freedom are the number of data points that help identify correlations or relationships in the data. And um, like, think about this, like what causes economic depressions? Well, how many have we had? Well, you can go back and you can look in Wikipedia and there's a really clear definition of what a depression is. And we can look at that definition and see whether or not these things apply. Well, we had a panic and we had another panic. So 1819, 1839, 1842, 1873 to 79, that was kind of some, something, 1907, there was a panic. 1910, 1911, like you can look through there, but the one we call a depression is 1929 to 1934. Okay, then we have like a new term. We had a recession in 2007, 2009. We have a recession now, kind of not really, it's not exactly clear what happened, but really if you look at all of those big major economic slowdowns, only one of them was a depression. And so people start to speculate. They're like, well, what was it that caused this depression? Like, well, we got lots of explanations. The next closest one was like 1837. There was some speculative real estate market. That's not even a depression. Maybe it is, I'm not exactly sure. Um, well, 1929, everyone's got lots of explanations for why the depression happened. Loose monetary policy, Wall Street crash, run on banks, inexpensive credit, blah, 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 blah. Well, if you've got five explanations and one event, which explanation is right? You can't have all five of them be right if they're all five different explanations and you're trying to explain one outcome. So if we're trying to explain one outcome, you're gonna have a lot of problems. You need to have lots of outcomes. You have to have more data points. If you have more data points to study, then you can kind of narrow down onto one explanation that might fit most of the data points. So that's really the key of degrees of freedom. Like if you want to, um, be confident in how good of a person this this one person is you could ask one person you could ask one person who who knows that knows let's say uh, sally so, so this person knows sally what do you think about sally oh well, she's good okay well like how confident can i be well let's start asking some other people so you ask four people four people generally say sally's good okay cool then you ask eight people and one of them says no sally's really bad we got seven in favor of Sally and one against Sally. You can still be more confident that Sally's a good person because you've got seven in favor and one against. By the time you ask 50 people, you can be pretty confident about how, like, how good Sally is. You ask a thousand people, you're way more confident, but you're probably starting to see diminishing returns. Like you shouldn't be asking these people all the time. So I guess what I'm saying is degrees of freedom increase our ability to get more data points to help us understand some phenomenon, some event, some pattern. We need to have more of them, but we probably don't need to have like millions of them. So there's some trade-off we'll talk about in sampling there. Um, nevertheless, the idea about degrees of freedom is, is core and when you're designing research, because if you're looking for establishing a relationship or pattern, you have to have enough, enough outcomes to study uh, and fewer explanations to try and predict what kind of outcome that is. So that's, um, that's the idea behind um, research design 
and um, research questions. Oh man, I'm trying to stop the uh, the recording. I don't know how to do that. Thank you.